The Men Return by Jack Vance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Men Return by Jack Vance. The relict came furtively down the crag, a shambling, gaunt creature with tortured eyes. He moved in a series of quick dashes, using panels of dark air for concealment, running behind each passing shadow, at times crawling on all fours, head low to the ground. Arriving at the final low outcrop of rock, he halted and peered across the plain. Far away rose low hills, blurring into the sky, which was mottled and sallow like poor milk glass. The intervening plain spread like rotten velvet, black-green and wrinkled, streaked with ochre and rust. A fountain of liquid rock jetted high in the air, branched out into black coral. In the middle distance, a family of gray objects evolved with a sense of purposeful destiny. Spheres melted into pyramids, became domes, tufts of white spires, sky-piercing poles, then, as a final tour de force, tesseracts. The relict cared nothing for this. He needed food, and out on the plain were plants. They would suffice in lieu of anything better. They grew in the ground, or sometimes on a floating lump of water, or surrounding a core of hard black gas. There were dank black flaps of leaf, clumps of haggard thorn, pale green bulbs, stalks with leaves and contorted flowers. There was no recognizable species, and the relict had no means of knowing if the leaves and tendrils he had eaten yesterday would poison him today. He tested the surface of the plain with his foot. The glassy surface, though it likewise seemed a construction of red and gray-green pyramids, accepted his weight, then suddenly sucked at his leg. In a frenzy, he tore himself free, jumped back, squatted on the temporarily solid rock. Hunger rasped at his stomach. He must eat. He contemplated the plain. Not too far away a pair of organisms played, sliding, driving, dancing, striking flamboyant poses. Should they approach, he would try to kill one of them. They resembled men, and so should make a good meal. He waited. A long time, a short time. It might have been either. Duration had neither quantitative nor qualitative reality. The sun had vanished, and there was no standard cycle or recurrence. Time was a word blank of meaning. Matter had not always been so. The relict retained a few tattered recollections of the old days, before system and logic had been rendered obsolete. Man had dominated Earth by virtue of a single assumption, that an effect could be traced to a cause, itself the effect of a previous cause. Manipulation of this basic law yielded rich results. There seemed no need for any other tool or instrumentality. Man congratulated himself on his generalized structure. He could live on desert, on plain or ice, in forest or in city. Nature had not shaped him to a special environment. He was unaware of his vulnerability. Logic was the special environment. The brain was the special tool. Then came the terrible hour when Earth swam into a pocket of non-causality, and all the ordered tensions of cause-effect dissolved. The special tool was useless. It had no purchase on reality. From the two billions of men, only a few survived. The mad. They were now the organisms, lords of the era, their discords so exactly equivalent to the vagaries of the land as to constitute a peculiar wild wisdom. Or perhaps the disorganized matter of the world, loose from the old organization, was peculiarly sensitive to psychokinesis. A handful of others, the relics, managed to exist, but only through a delicate set of circumstances. They were the ones most strongly charged with the old causal dynamic. It persisted sufficiently to control the metabolism of their bodies, but could extend no further. They were fast dying out, for sanity provided no leverage against the environment. Sometimes their own minds sputtered and jangled, and they would go raving and leaping out across the plain. The organisms observed with neither surprise nor curiosity. How could surprise exist? The mad relict might pause by an organism and try to duplicate the creature's existence. The organism ate a mouthful of plant. So did the relict. The organism rubbed his feet with crushed water. So did the relict. Presently the relict would die of poison or rent bowels or skin lesions, while the organism relaxed in the dank black grass. Or the organism might seek to eat the relict, and the relict would run off in terror, unable to abide any part of the world, running, bounding, breasting the thick air. Eyes wide, mouth open, calling and gasping, 
until finally he floundered in a pool of black iron or blundered into a vacuum pocket to bat around like a fly in a bottle. The relics now numbered very few. Finn, he who crouched on the rock overlooking the plain, lived with four others. Two of these were old men and soon would die. Finn, likewise, would die unless he found food. Out on the plain, one of the organisms, Alpha, sat down, caught a handful of air, a globe of blue liquid, a rock, kneaded them together, pulled the mixture like taffy, gave it a great heave. It uncoiled from his hand like a rope. The relic crouched low. No telling what devilry would occur to the creature. He and all the rest of them, unpredictable. The relic valued their flesh as food, but they also would eat him if opportunity offered. In the competition, he was at a great disadvantage. Their random acts baffled him. If, seeking to escape, he ran, the worst terror would begin. The direction he set his face was seldom the direction the varying frictions of the ground let him move. But the organisms were as random and uncommitted as the environment, and the double set of vagaries sometimes compounded, sometimes cancelled each other. In the latter case, the organisms might catch him. It was inexplicable, but then what was not? The word explanation had no meaning. They were moving toward him. Had they seen him? He flattened himself against the sullen yellow rock. The two organisms paused not far away. He could hear their sounds and crouched, sick from conflicting pangs of hunger and fear. Alpha sank to his knees, lay flat on his back, arms and legs flung out at random, addressing the sky in a series of musical cries, sibilants, guttural groans. It was a personal language he had only now improvised, but Beta understood him well. "'A vision!' cried Alpha. "'I see past the sky. I see knots, spinning circles. They tighten into hard points. They will never come undone.' Beta perched on a pyramid, glanced over the shoulder at the mottled sky. "'An intuition!' chanted Alpha. A picture out of the other time. It is hard, merciless, inflexible. Beta poised on the pyramid, dove through the glassy surface, swam under Alpha, emerged, lay flat beside him. Observe the relict on the hillside. In his blood is the whole of the old race, the narrow men with minds like cracks. He has exuded the intuition. Clumsy thing, a blunderer, said Alpha. They are all dead, all of them, said Beta although three or four remain. When past, present, and future are no more than ideas left over from another era, like boats on a dry lake, then the completion of a process can never be defined. Alpha said, This is the vision. I see the relics swarming the earth. Then, whisking off to nowhere, like gnats in the wind, this is behind us. The organisms lay quiet, considering the vision. A rock, or perhaps a meteor, fell from the sky struck into the surface of the pond. It left a circular hole, which slowly closed. From another part of the pool, a gout of fluid splashed into the air, floated away. Alpha spoke. Again! The intuition comes strong! There will be lights in the sky! The fever died in him. He hooked a finger into the air, hoisted himself to his feet. Beta lay quiet. Slugs, ants, flies, beetles were crawling on him, boring, breeding... Alpha knew that Beta could arise, shake off the insects, stride off. But Beta seemed to prefer passivity. That was well enough. He could produce another Beta should he choose, or a dozen of him. Sometimes the world swarmed with organisms, all sorts, all colors, tall as steeples, short and squat as flower pots. I feel a lack, said Alpha. I will eat the relict. He set forth, and sheer chance brought him near to the ledge of yellow rock. Finn the relict sprang to his feet in panic. Alpha tried to communicate, so that Finn might pause while Alpha ate, but Finn had no grasp for the many-valued overtones of Alpha's voice. He seized a rock, hurled it at Alpha. The rock puffed into a cloud of dust, blew back into the relict's face. Alpha moved closer, extended his long arms. The relict kicked. His feet went out from under him, and he slid out on the plain. Alpha ambled complacently behind him. Finn began to crawl away. Alpha moved off to the right. One direction was as good as another. He collided with Beta, and began to eat Beta instead of the relict. The relict hesitated, then approached, and, joining Alpha, pushed chunks of pink flesh into his mouth. Alpha said to the relict, I was about to communicate an intuition to him whom we dine upon. I will speak to you. Finn could not understand Alpha's personal language. He ate as rapidly as possible, 
Alpha spoke on. There will be lights in the sky. The great lights. Finn rose to his feet and, warily watching Alpha, seized Beta's legs, began to pull him toward the hill. Alpha watched with quizzical unconcern. It was hard work for the spindly relict. Sometimes Beta floated. Sometimes he wafted off on the air. Sometimes he adhered to the terrain. At last he sank into a knob of granite which froze around him. Finn tried to jerk Beta loose and then to pry him up with a stick without success. He ran back and forth in an agony of indecision. Beta began to collapse, wither like a jellyfish on hot sand. The relict abandoned the hulk. Too late. Too late. Food going to waste. The world was a hideous place of frustration. Temporarily his belly was full. He started back up the crag and presently found the camp, where the four other relics waited. Two ancient males, two females. The females, Giza and Reek, like Finn, had been out foraging. Giza had brought in a slab of lichen, Reek a bit of nameless carrion. The old men, Bode and Taggart, sat quietly, waiting either for food or for death. The women greeted Finn sullenly. "'Where is the food you went forth to find?' "'I had a whole carcass,' said Finn. "'I could not carry it.' Bode had slyly stolen the slab of lichen and was cramming it into his mouth. It came alive, quivered, and exuded a red ichor which was poison, and the old man died. "'Now there is food,' said Finn. "'Let us eat.' But the poison created a putrescence. The body, seethed with blue foam, flowed away of its own energy. The women turned to look at the other old man, who said in a quavering voice, "'Eat me if you must, but why not choose Reek, who is younger than I?' Reek, the younger of the women, gnawing on the bit of carrion, made no reply. Finn said hollowly, "'Why do we worry ourselves? Food is even more difficult, and we are the last of all men.' "'No, no,' spoke Reek. "'Not the last. We saw others on the green mound.' "'That was long ago,' said Giza. Now they are surely dead. Perhaps they have found a source of food, suggested Reek. Finn rose to his feet, looked across the plain. Who knows? Perhaps there is a more pleasant land beyond the horizon. There is nothing anywhere but waste and evil creatures, snapped Giza. What could be worse than here? Finn argued calmly. No one could find grounds for disagreement. Here is what I propose, said Finn. Notice this tall peak. Notice the layers of hard air. They bump into the peak. They bounce off. They float in and out and disappear past the edge of sight. Let us all climb this peak, and when a sufficiently large bank of air passes, we will throw ourselves on top and allow it to carry us to the beautiful regions which may exist just out of sight. There was argument. The old man Taggart protested his feebleness. The women derided the possibility of the bountiful regions Finn envisioned. But presently, grumbling and arguing, they began to clamber up the pinnacle. It took a long time. The obsidian was soft as jelly, and Taggart several times professed himself at the limit of his endurance. But still they climbed, and at last reached the pinnacle. There was barely room to stand. They could see in all directions, far out over the landscape, till vision was lost in the watery gray. The women bickered and pointed in various directions, but there was small sign of happier territory. In one direction blue-green hills shivered like bladders full of oil. In another direction lay a streak of black, a gorge or a lake of clay. In another direction were blue-green hills, the same they had seen in the first direction. Somehow there had been a shift. Below was the plain, gleaming like an iridescent beetle, here and there pocked with black velvet spots, overgrown with questionable vegetation. They saw organisms, a dozen shapes loitering by ponds, munching vegetable pods or small rocks or insects. There came Alpha. He moved slowly, still awed by his vision, ignoring the other organisms. Their play went on, but presently they stood quiet, sharing the oppression. On the obsidian peak, Finn caught hold of a passing filament of air, drew it in. Now, all on, and we sail away to the land of plenty. No, protested Giza. There is no room. And who knows if it will fly in the right direction? Where is the right direction? asked Finn. Does anyone know? No one knew. But the women still refused to climb aboard the filament. Finn turned to Taggart. Here, old one, show these women how it is. Climb on. No, no, he cried. I fear the air. This is not for me. Climb on, old man. Then we follow. 
Wheezing and fearful, clenching his hands deep into the spongy mass, Taggart pulled himself out onto the air, spindly shanks hanging over into nothing. Now, spoke Finn, who next? The women still refused. You go then yourself, cried Giza. And leave you, my last guarantee against hunger, aboard now. No, the air is too small. Let the old one go and we will follow on a larger. Very well, Finn released his grip. The air floated off over the plain, Taggart straddling and clutching for dear life. They watched him curiously. Observe, said Finn, how fast and easily moves the air, above the organisms, over all the slime and uncertainty. But the air itself was uncertain, and the old man's raft dissolved. Clutching at the departing wisps, Taggart sought to hold his cushion together. It fled from under him, and he fell. On the peak, the three watched the spindly shape flap and twist on its way to earth far below. Now, Reek exclaimed vexatiously, we even have no more meat. None, said Giza, except the visionary Finn himself. They surveyed Finn. Together they would more than outmatch him. Careful, cried Finn. I am the last of the men. You are my women, subject to my orders. They ignored him, muttering to each other looking at him from the side of their faces. "'Careful!' cried Finn. "'I will throw you both from this peak.' "'That is what we plan for you,' said Giza. They advanced with sinister caution. "'Stop! I am the last man!' "'We are better off without you. One moment! Look at the organisms!' The women looked. The organisms stood in a knot, staring at the sky. "'Look at the sky!' The women looked. The frosted glass was cracking, breaking, curling aside. The blue, the blue sky of old times. A terribly bright light burnt down, seared their eyes. The rays warmed their naked backs. The sun, they said in awed voices. The sun has come back to earth. The shrouded sky was gone. The sun rode proud and bright in a sea of blue. The ground below churned, cracked, heaved, solidified. They felt the obsidian harden under their feet. Its color shifted to glossy black. The earth, the sun, the galaxy, had departed the region of freedom. The other time, with its restrictions and logic, was once more with them. "'This is old earth,' cried Finn. "'We are men of old earth. The land is once again ours.' "'And what of the organisms?' "'If this is the earth of old, then let the organisms beware.' The organisms stood on a low rise of ground beside a runnel of water that was rapidly becoming a river flowing out onto the plain. Alpha cried, Here is my intuition. It is exactly as I knew. The freedom is gone. The tightness, the constriction are back. How will we defeat it? asked another organism. Easily, said a third. Each must fight a part of the battle. I plan to hurl myself at the sun and blot it from existence and he crouched, threw himself into the air. He fell on his back and broke his neck. The fault, said Alpha, is in the air, because the air surrounds all things. Six organisms ran off in search of air and, stumbling into the river, drowned. In any event, said Alpha, I am hungry. He looked around for suitable food. He seized an insect which stung him. He dropped it. My hunger remains. He spied Finn and the two women descending from the crag. "'I will eat one of the relics,' he said. "'Come, let us all eat.' Three of them started off as usual in random directions. By chance, Alpha came face to face with Finn. He prepared to eat, but Finn picked up a rock. The rock remained a rock, hard, sharp, heavy. Finn swung it down, taking joy in the inertia. Alpha died with a crushed skull. One of the other organisms attempted to step across a crevasse twenty feet wide and disappeared into it. The other sat down, swallowed rocks to assuage his hunger, and presently went into convulsions. Finn pointed here and there around the fresh new land. In that quarter, the new city, like that of the legends, over here the farms, the cattle. We have none of these, protested Giza. No, said Finn, not now. But once more the sun rises and sets, once more rock has weight, and air has none, once more water falls as rain and flows to the sea. He stepped forward over the fallen organism. Let us make plans. 
End of The Men Return by Jack Vance.